teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Revelation chapter 12. I love this set of verses here. It refers to something about testimony of what we should never forget relating to how we overcome in this life as a believer. We understand clearly here if we pick up in verse 9, it talks about this great dragon, Satan, <clears throat> was cast out of heaven, that serpent of old called the devil, who deceives the whole world. What did he, what did he come here to do? To deceive the whole world. To some degree, we've all been affected by that. Thank God we don't have to live in it any longer. We can learn to walk in the truth that sets us free. Amen? Yes. But in some way, he has in, in our lives all affected us by some aspect of deception. Notice he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Uh, verse 10, then I heard a loud voice. Say a loud voice. Loud voice. Saying in heaven. Saying in heaven. See, <clears throat> if you're not going to like getting rejoicing, uh, excuse me, if you're not going to like getting loud at praising and rejoicing God here on earth, you're not going to like heaven. I'll never forget, I, I always think of this when I see this. I always think of this one guy in my church came to me and said, Pastor, I brought my friend the last couple of weeks. Yeah, he's not coming back. I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <clears throat> so why not? He said, well, he said, y'all are too loud. No joke. Y'all are too loud. Like we get too excited about Jesus. Yeah, he don't like it. We ain't gonna like heaven. Thank you, Tamara. <clears throat> I can always rely on Tamara to be my ameter. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 10, I heard a loud voice. <clears throat> I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now, the fact this is in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> Revelation is not written chronologically. So this is not talking about a time to come. This is talking about something that already happened. How do we know? Satan booted out of heaven, verse 10, and he said, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, the power of his Christ, the power of his Christ have come. When Jesus came, what did he do everywhere he went? Kingdom of God's at hand. <clears throat> it's available. So what he's talking about is the time when Jesus came to the earth and fulfilled what was needed for us to have victory over this very Satan, this very demon, this enemy of ours, <clears throat> who was cast down to the earth. Verse 11, how do we do that? They overcame him. Yes. How? By the blood of the lamb, yes. by the word. word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. And we recently touched on this, but there's three things that he talks about here of how we overcome relationship to what we've been receiving from Jesus through his blood shed for us. How do we overcome the works of Satan? How do we overcome attacks on our body? How do we overcome attacks on our soul? How do we overcome attacks on our family or our finances or anything for that matter? How do we overcome blood of the lamb, word of our testimony, loving not our lives to the death? So the blood of the lamb refers to us having to have knowledge of what happened when Jesus shed his blood for you. If I just know Jesus shed his blood, thank you, Jesus, I'm born again. That's not good enough. What did he shed his blood to do? Redeem you, deliver you, free you. Yes. By his stripes, blood shed. Yes. Blood shed. You've been healed. Yes. Right? By his blood, you've been redeemed yes. from the curse of the law. So we have to have knowledge. We have to have understanding of what the blood did for us. Why do I need a shepherd? Jeremiah 3.15, he's going to feed you with knowledge and understanding. So you can know what the blood of Jesus accomplished for you. Amen? But once I know that, what do I have to do? I got to testify. Yes. I overcome by the blood of the lamb. Say it, I, I overcome, overcome by the blood of the lamb. Of the lamb. So that's knowledge of what Jesus did for you. And say, I, I overcome, overcome by the word of my testimony. Now, what are we overcoming? Satan and his works. Now, this doesn't mean you got to get up and testify to everybody of what God's done for you to overcome. But the word testimony here is referring to like somebody going into a courtroom. And that person going into a courtroom, if they are a witness 
of something that's happened are going to have to testify. The word of my testimony means I'm a witness to what my God has said in his word and what he's done for me. I'm a witness of his word being the truth and it works. I'm a witness of, not like you were there to see Jesus die, but I'm just saying you are a witness in your heart. Where does the witness come from? Our spirit man. We have a witness in our heart as we do what? Meditate on the word. Faith comes by hearing by the, so we get a witness in our heart. This is for me. This isn't just for these people who are sharing their testimony. Right? This is for all of us. How do all of us overcome? Understanding the blood of the lamb and the word of our what? Say, I got to become a witness to what Jesus has done. Now, to do that, you got to do what? Testify. So when the enemy brings the attack, you know what you do? You just stick it right back in his face and say, Satan, let me just remind you from the word of God of what my Jesus did for me. Let me testify for a minute of what my Jesus did for me. Amen? Amen. So you overcome by the blood of the Lamb, word of your testimony, and also you do not what? Love your lives to the death. So you cannot live your life in the way in which you want to And have God bless you and help you to do what God desires to do in your life. Well, why not? Because your ways are not his. His ways are higher and much better. I can't choose to live a carnal, fleshly, sinful life and expect God to help me walk in victory. God is not cursing you or hurting your life when you choose to walk in sin. You're cursing yourself. What you're doing, giving in to any aspect of what God says is not right for your life, is you're opening the door for Satan to come in and take advantage of your life. So it's not enough that I just know what the blood did. It's not enough that I'm a witness of it in my heart. I also got to do what? Make sure that I'm not loving my life to the death. Can I put it a simple way? Go look at the Garden of Gethsemane. What did Jesus say? Not my will, Father. Your will be done. He was your model. He was your example. I'm not here to live out my will. The reason that I have no problem being a pastor is because I know this is God's will, not mine. This is God's will. It's what he called me to do. Not, that's not for everybody, but I know that's what he called me to do. It doesn't bother me to work six days a week. No, I don't go to golf courses and hang out on the golf course every day. And then just show up and throw together a little sermon off of sermon.com. I don't look up sermons. I talk to God. I pray you hear from God. I feel sorry for all these pastors that go to sermon.com to get all their messages to be able to preach to their congregations. None of that's anointed. Not the way it should be because they're not hearing it from God. But it doesn't bother me to do what I do. It doesn't bother me to exhaust myself in doing the work of the kingdom. You know why? I'm only going to get one chance to do it. I only get one life to do it. I don't want to get to heaven and hear from God. Man, look at all the more things you could have done for me had you been going after my will and not yours. Can I get a better amen? But I'm going to miss out on so much. Let me help you. Let me help you. If you love Jesus... And you're not lukewarm. Don't raise your hand to that one. You're not not a lukewarm believer. Right? 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 Right. So you're not a lukewarm believer. He comes back and raptures you off the planet after seven uh, seven years of tribulation. You're going to come back with it. By the way, Becky will like this. I know she's in the nursery. (laughs) Guess what you're going to come back on? Horses. Horses. If you're not a cowboy or cowgirl yet, you might want to become one. (laughs) Because that's what the Bible said, like it or not. You're going to come back on a horse. Amen? Amen. So we're going to come back. Does anybody know what we're going to come back and do? When we first get back here, there's going to be what's known as a battle of Armageddon. This is China, Iran, Iraq, Russia, all these uh, entities over there coming down against Israel to try to overtake Israel. How long does the battle last? (laughs) The blast of God's nostrils, they're done. They're done. And then you know what we do? We get to rule and reign here. For a thousand years. Come on, man. If you live a good long life to a hundred, compare that to a thousand. Now here's what God's asking. This is how testimonies occur. This is what God's asking. You know what God's asking? Give me the tithe of your life. Compare a hundred years to a thousand. Give me the tithe. If you'll give me the tithe of your life, you're going to come back and do whatever you want for a thousand years. And by the way, you won't be restricted by a moral body. Mortal body. You'll have an immortal body like Jesus. You can pass through walls. You listening? You can go anywhere on the planet you want. Check out whatever you want. You know, what did you not get to see while you were here? Amen. Stay out of the cabin on the highest mountain on the the planet because I'm going to be there. 
No, I'll let you come in. We'll have some fellowship. Praise the Lord. I'm joking. Listen, guys, you got to understand, you're not going to be able to walk out true testimonies for God living for your life, for your own self. You're going to miss out on what God has. God has a bigger plan. I said he has a bigger plan. So we overcome by the what? Blood of the lamb, word of our testimony, not loving our lives to the death. So the testimonies you're going to hear about tonight are from people who have seen God work things in their life, do things in their life that they know was him. I don't like when people just come up and say something that's really not something God did and claim it as a testimony. So that's why I ask all these people to submit to me their testimonies because I want you to hear from people that really had God do something in their life. I'm not, quote unquote, taking away from those who claim sometimes God did something, but the truth is, I mean, there's things that can happen in this life. What I mean by that, that obviously God didn't do that just happened because they happened, but I want to know it was God. I want to know this was God doing this in your life. Amen? Amen. And that way we know we can give the glory to him. A lot of people say, well, I give God glory for everything that happens in my life. Uh, I might want to check out everything that goes on in your life. Say, do I really want to do that? I want to make sure that it's truly worthy of his honor and his praise. Amen? Amen. So tonight we're going to start off with our first testimony. Now, as these guys come up, I want you to encourage them. Praise the Lord. They're not all preachers like your pastor. You guys have the option to stand behind the pulpit or down front. Doesn't matter to me, whichever you want to do. There is no, quote, unquote, in a sense, time limit. Although if you start preaching beyond 15 minutes, <laughs> Josh the usher, my armor bearer, he going to be coming after you. <laughs> so this isn't like, hey, you get turned loose to go on for a half an hour kind of thing. But we want to hear. We want to hear specifically what did God do. And therefore, bless and encourage everybody else. Amen. Amen. Joshua McLean, you are the first one. Up there, down here. Thanks, Pastor. You're very kind to let me go first. Up there. Down here. I knew you'd be excited about being the first one, so that's why I chose you. Hey, church family. I just want to start off by saying uh, this actually happened about a year ago or a year and a half ago. And uh, it was on my heart the whole time to let Pastor know and drug my feet, didn't say anything. And so uh, I'm glad you gave us the opportunity to do this because Holy Spirit really pricked my heart to share this. <clears throat> so uh, I'll start off by saying, if, if you don't know that I am in uh, a union, I'm in the Fire Sprinkler Union, and we all know that unions, they all have their good, they have their bad. And uh, so that's where, that's... Uh, and actually, this union has been a huge blessing in my life. I, I came into the union about nine years ago. <clears throat> and uh, so in my union, like I said, they're all different. They have good stuff. They have bad stuff. In mine, if you don't work, you don't get paid. So no sick days, no holidays, no uh, PTO. Uh, I mean, straight up, if you don't work, you don't get paid, and that's, that's all there is to it. One of the benefits to that also is you know, I could take a two, three, four week vacation, come back and still have my job just like that. So, but three or four weeks of no pay, right? <clears throat> and so uh, we're also, uh, because of the union, we're also on an hourly rate, there's a scale. And so everybody knows what everybody makes. From the day one you come in till if you're a fitter or a, a foreman, somebody that's in a truck, everybody knows what everybody makes. So. If you, you could let yourself get off in the flesh and get frustrated because you're like, man, I know my jobs make money. I'm doing better than this guy. Um, I don't, uh, you know, this guy over here, he, he turns four-hour jobs into six- or eight-hour jobs, and you could let yourself easily get discouraged or get frustrated because it's, well, why do I come over here and work so hard and, and make so much money for the company, and this guy gets to keep his job, and he's losing money on a lot of his jobs, Right. And so <clears throat> discouragement has definitely, it's tried to get on me, but I just don't let that happen. Um, so with that being said, you have to really check your heart why you're doing this because there's not a whole lot of aspiration to be the best in the company because it's not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to do anything for you. You're just going to keep on trucking along, keeping your job. And like I said, just be better than the guy that's on the bottom, right? So <clears throat> my boss and president, they've told me, I've been at this company, this, this month was eight years. They told me uh, for the last seven years, they said that 
I'm one of the top money makers. I'm always fighting with this guy, number one, number two. We'd call each other, hey, you number one this month? Hey, you're number two this month? And so <clears throat> my boss would tell me, all your jobs make money. And so I'm like, well, that's a very nice to hear, um, but I'm just doing what I do, right? I just, I mean, I, I know my God. I know I'm blessed, and I just keep doing what I'm supposed to do, the next best thing, right? So the boss calls me one day, and he says, you know, I'm going to put a package together for you, and uh, I'm going to present that to you and see if you would be in interested in that. And so I really didn't know what that meant. Um, but I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll wait for your call. Well, kind of get discouraged a little bit. Two months go by, three months goes by, and I'm like, maybe he forgot about me, right? I'm praying about it. Well, boss didn't forget about me. He said he's going to call and take care of me, and so I know he will take care of me. And uh, so he calls one day, and he says, he says, uh, I want this, the package I want to offer you is, is to pay you a, a dollar over scale. I want to give you a week's worth of paid time off. I want to, um, he said, even if I work on a Saturday or a Sunday, Saturday we get double time, Sundays, or Saturday's overtime, Sunday's double time. He said, if you need to uh, say you work a Saturday or a Sunday, you want to stack a PTO day on top of that, then I'll pay you for all that. And that'd be like a triple or quadruple time, right, for that one day. And, um, and he also asked me, he said, and I'd like to know what kind of jobs you want. Do you want to do service? you want to do new install? Like, what do you want to do? I'll let you pick your jobs. And so that's, that's my testimony. That, that's how my boss has blessed me. And so pastor asked, well, what did I do to, to, get, to get this blessing is I just go do what I know to do. I don't let myself get discouraged. I... Um, don't compare myself to the next guy under me. I just continue to go be the best, right? Even though there's no aspiration at this in the union to, to, do, to do any better. And uh, just do hard, I just, I just do it by prayer, hard work, and, and like I said, just do the next best thing. You know, God sees everything that we do, and just because our boss doesn't see it doesn't mean that God can't prick that guy one day. And his timing is the best and not our timing. <coughs> And uh, just to finish off with that, it's very, it's very awesome because I do work for a godly company. We're woman-owned. We pray before all of our meals, our meetings. My boss, I had a meeting with him two weeks ago and was sharing some things with him. And he texted me later and said, hey, man, I'll be praying for you. So it really is a, a blessing for this company. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. What I thought of, the Bible says, everything you do, do it as unto the Lord. And if you do, God will reward you. Praise God. Amen. Lakshmi, you're next. She also has a job testimony about a situation with her and her work. So you coming up here or staying down there? You staying down there? You sure? Well, the mic's up here. Are people streaming? Amen. Huh? You're good. No, they can't. Oh, really? Just stay up no, here. Just You're good. You don't use the mic. Okay, no, I, I was teasing her, man. I was teasing her about coming up here. <laughs> so I'm trying to try to limit this to 15 minutes, but Hold I'm not up. sure. <laughs> Hold your mic up. Okay. Um, so a um, couple of years ago, Pastor said that um, he's going to open up Mondays for corporate prayer. So that was um, that brought us excitement, Gopi and I, because we know what corporate prayer meant. It meant the highest praise that we're giving to God. And the reason that being a highest praise is because we are speaking his mind. And we knew we had some... Um, unresolved issues in our lives, and we needed to hear from God. But we already knew that God had given us, and we came here to receive. So Gopi and I had a private meeting <laughs> at home, and we decided no matter what, we will keep this Monday night prayer, no matter what. So obviously, we know the devil works. <laughs> And so he started bringing um, uh, immediately. He, he, he tried to come against a Monday night <laughs> prayer. He, it started off Monday mornings. We had some uh, medical emergencies. And um, the first day when it happened, we recognized it. So we didn't come here. But the next Monday, we decided we are going to go no matter what. So on the way, we had medical emergencies with my son. 
we still came and it went on for the next few Mondays and and then devil knew that we he couldn't win against us um, because um, we use the scripture, the scripture from Isaiah. It said that when the devil comes against you, the, the spirit of God raises a barrier. Yeah. So we used it. Yep. <laughs> and um, during that entire time, every Monday consistently, consistently kept coming here. Um, during that time, my employer decided that they are um, sinking. <laughs> so we didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. So uh, last year, January, they decided that they were going to let go of a few people. Well, the few turned out to be thousands. <laughs> so um, I, I mean, fortunately, I know um, I was not in one of them, but within 24 hours, the people that I used to work with were gone, just simply gone. So we didn't know who was there and who wasn't. So we knew that this was not going to stop. This was going to continue. During that time, um, I was thinking every time I would apply for jobs, I would remember uh, Nancy Dufresne once said, don't jump ships during troubled waters. So I decided to stay back, continue. I went to India and came back. And, um, and the next round of firing happened. And in that, I escaped too. <laughs> so uh, by this time, I think it was sometime end of September, I believe it was. It was the last day of September. It was a Thursday. And I usually work in the morning, and I end by 3.30. By 4 o'clock, I was still working, and I got a call from my boss. And she said that I just got notified that your job is going to be eliminated. And so then I asked her, um, when is my last day? She said, tomorrow. So, um, so I said, no worries. And so my boss said, and I was so calm, so quiet, so peaceful, because during one of our prayers, Miss Kathy said, um, Miss Kathy prayed for me. Um, she specifically said that I will find a creative job and that my talents will be used. And so I believed it. I, uh, I took it to the Lord every time I would be, the anxiety would try to come on me, but I stayed, I had to work through all that. So on um, Thursday evening, she said to me that, you know, you're going to get an exit letter relinquishing all rights kind of things. So you have to sign up on it. So um, I said, okay. And I waited for the letter. The letter never came. Friday came, and I forgot that today was my last, that day was my last day. I started working as usual. Then about an hour and a half later, um, I saw someone had called me, and I didn't recognize, and I usually don't pick up the phone during my work hours, but that day, suddenly I realized, oh my goodness, today's my last day, let me send an email, a mass email to all of my partners, my clients, um, my outpatient clinics, and everything, and I, and I was explaining to them, come Monday, I will, not, you, I will not be here, cancel all meetings, I do not know who's going to be taking care of y'all, kind of thing. So, um, um, and then I looked at my messages, and one of the messages was kind of, um, it came from a UNT uh, Health Sciences, and I had uh, forgotten that I had applied for that job a few months ago. Randomly, I was just doing it. And they actually, they called me for an interview. I went there, on-site interview, phone call interview, and I didn't think of anything about it. But, um, and they had given me an offer letter within eight, 10 hours of me. I, before I even signed the exit letter, I accepted their offer. Wow. So the coolest thing about that is that job that they offered me, they actually combined several different jobs to create a job for me because they wanted me in there. And this is exactly what I was doing many, many years ago. And this required, and, and they were willing to work with me and flexible and kind of thing and more benefits and things like that. So I was very thankful for that because um, I believe the consistency of coming to the prayer, making that determination and fighting through all that actually caused that. My right, and there was one more testimony I said. <laughs> um, so last year, um, Ananya, like many of y'all know, my daughter, she's in, she graduated from medical school. So 
after going through four years of medical school, she has to take an exam called step one exam, which is a nine, nine hour exam. So she finished that exam and that exam would point her to uh, something called match program. And a match is where the students, the medical students would give a list of their their chosen hospitals that they would like to work for, and then the hospitals would give a list of the chosen students that they want them to come and work for them. So, so the, and then the computer, there's an algorithm that matches both of them together. It's called a match day. And in US, there were close to 70,000 applicants. Uh, so from all over, actually not only from US, it's all over international, they would apply. And the computer decides, but it's also dependent on um, the hospitals, who they want, because they already worked with them in clinical programs. So basically what Ananya did was, for many years, you know, she wanted to be in emergency. And last minute, <laughs> after she wrote her exam, before she applied, she changed her mind. So she was taking a risk, the match. You know, they didn't know Ananya in that program. They only knew Ananya in the emergency side. She, they did not know Ananya anywhere else. So um, the match day came, several of the students, I mean all the app medical students waited, and by four o'clock that Monday, everyone should have heard from the hospitals. And if they didn't hear, next day they get one more turn, one more time to match. So she didn't hear on Monday. <laughs> so Tuesday came by again. 3.30, she did not hear anything. So that's when I, and I remember during our prayer, Miss Kathy had prayed that Ananya will ride the waves of God. And I kept repeating, you said she will ride the waves of God. You said it in your word, and your word is true. So it is true. I'm not going to feel anxiety. I'm not going to feel anxious. She's not going to feel anxious. You're going to choose your child. So it's almost a fight, a battle that I went in spiritually. So 3.45, as I'm driving through the traffic, in Fort Worth, 3.50, Gopi calls me and says, Ananya just got an, um, a call from a Trauma One hospital. They're looking into her application. They wanted her to know, and they wanted her to sign the contract by 3.59, so she's in their system. So by 4 o'clock, she signed it in Trauma One. So I give him all the glory. But I do want to say, throughout this ordeal, Holy Spirit brought to me Isaiah 43, 9. Um, I am sorry, uh, Isaiah 43, 2, where he said, when you walk through the deep waters, I will hold you. When you walk through the river of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire, the flames will not consume you. And because of our, 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 our um, I give glory to him, but at the same time, he's teaching us to be obedient, to stick to it, to fight through it. And that, that uh, prayer, the corporate prayer, being in the unity and praying with others, is I believe was so important to us because there's safety in that unity. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I'll tell you, corporate prayer is really powerful. And if you're part of this church family, know that you're being prayed for. Amen. Guess who's next? I don't know. Tamra. Tamra Hines. Grayson's going to come spell you on the camera. What does Tamra not do around here? Children's ministry. She does camera. She, oh, you can't? No. Matt, you want to teach her? <laughs> you coming up here, right? Yes, Everybody see you better. Okay, because I'm short. See your smile. See, I'm short. Give Tamara a good hand. Praise <laughs> the Lord. I didn't know I was going to do this. I mean, <laughs> I know I gave it to you, but anyway, I am going to share about, um, you know, working for uh, the mices. I was blessed to be able to take Miss Renee down to Houston last year. And um, on the way back home after I left her, I was driving home by myself and listening to teaching and praying, and my truck overheated. And I was like, okay. 
So I pull off, I'm talking to Butch, telling him what's going on, and he said, you know, let it cool down. I had some water in the truck, and I poured the water in there. I sat there, I I wasn't upset, you know, I wasn't afraid or anything, so let it cool down, started it back up, start going back down the road, and it gets worse. (laughs) So this time I'm like, okay, Butch, I'm gonna have to sit here for a while, and um, I'll let you know, you know, if somebody stops or whatever. So I was out of water. I knew I needed water. So down this steep hill is these two houses. And I'm like, Lord, do I get out of the car? Do I go down there? And I had broken my knee a year before that. So going down a steep hill is not my friend. So I was like, okay, I can do this, I can do this. And I didn't tell Butch what I was doing because I knew he would be very upset with me. So I'm marching down this steep hill and going, Lord, I haven't asked for help, but I need help now. And all of a sudden, here comes this car, shroom, down the hill, onto the service road before I even get to these people's house, Rolls down his window and says, I believe you need some help, don't you? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm standing there, I'm going, okay, Lord, you know, I'm asking for help. Is this this big, burly guy, you know, is he going to help me? So I had a piece, you know, you, you have to have. So he said, well, get in and let's, I'm going to drive up, the, up here again. I'm not going to make you climb up there. And he went and he looked at it and he goes, it's broke. There was a piece that was broke. Butch had just replaced it, the heating, heating harness, and a piece was defective. So this gentleman puts me in his truck and for three hours carts me around from the middle of nowhere between Houston and I can't remember if uh, Fairview, where, it was where I was at. I know you know where we was. And carted me back and forth, worked on the truck three different times, and finally got it fixed where he thought I was going to be okay, and followed me at least 20 miles to make sure it didn't break. But that's how good God is. He sent this big man, and I don't know if I ever shared with, I shared with you, he was a moonshiner, y'all, <laughs> but he, he had moonshine in the back. He didn't have water, he had moonshine. He goes, I don't think I can pour that in your truck, but we'll go find water, right? So he was just the sweetest man. His last name was Woe Big, and he was Woe Big. <laughs> He was the sweetest man, but God is so faithful, so faithful. So just trust. And it it all does come from knowing that you serve a mighty God and you have people in your corner praying for you. So, amen. Um, No. (laughs) Thank you. Praise the Lord. Miss Kim, come on, you're no veteran now. You, you got up here for Pastor Appreciation Day. Praise the Lord. This is a powerful testimony. God is a good God to help us to overcome stuff and walk in victory. Amen. Jesus' name. Welcome, Miss Kim. Come on. You didn't tell me. Okay, it's still freaky, okay? <laughs> um, who? You didn't tell me. I didn't get that email. I did tell everybody. I didn't get that email. Two Sundays I said, if you sent me a testimony, you're going to be testifying. Okay. (laughs) And I thought I'll email you. Anyway, doesn't matter. I I got this because God is good. Oh, he's good. Um, I (laughs) wish I had the paper on now. Uh, I uh, was lived in depression. I'll just point blank tell you. I mean... There's a difference in sadness and the oppression of depression. It pushes, and I lived with it most of my life. I was an only child, so I played by myself, and that's just part of it. Um, I uh, would come to church. Miss Tamara worked with me, so she knows. I mean, I would stand there sometimes 
crying, washing the dishes. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, okay. Uh, I was always sad inside. Just, it would come to church, um, and at one point, I was like, I went to pastor and I said, I'm a hypocrite, because here I am praising God, but I want to die. I don't want to be here. So, through the time, I kept reading the Word, reading the Word, reading the Word, and seeing who I was in Christ. God always brought people across my path. They would speak to me from church. They'd say, you are a blessed woman. Just out of the blue, they'd call and do that. Or pastor would say something as he walked by because the church was there. He would say, um, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. And I'd go, oh, yeah, I'm breathing. Praise the Lord. I just continued in this over and over and over for years. Um, one time, I would leave. When Tamara worked with me, uh, she stayed late, and I went home early this one particular day, and I just was sad. I was just had no... It's, it's not if you don't, you don't know. It's just different. Um, I was at home. I didn't wasn't happy. I was sitting there all by myself in the house, and I was like, Lord, send somebody. Have someone call me, please. Just, you know, have Pastor call me. Have Debbie call me. Somebody just to help, because I really am sad today. No reason, because God loved me. Nothing was wrong. I just, this oppression is just overwhelming. And uh, my cousin pulls up, and I went, oh, Lord, I don't want to deal with her. <laughs> it's not, it's a, I love my cousin, but I didn't want to deal with her. So she comes in, and she sits down, and she says, well, I just got out of a mental institution. I tried to kill myself. And uh, for three days, we, uh, they, they keep you there for three days. Apparently, that's the way the state does it or whatever. And she told me the things that they did to her. Well, that in the mornings, they uh, made everybody go outside, have a few moments alone, and pray to their God, or talk to their God. And I went, well, that's, you know, meditating, you know, giving praise to God. And I would pop a scripture off to her. And then she said, we had to uh, write down if we were hurt about something, write it on a piece of paper and put it in a box and not think of it anymore. It's like, okay, well, that's, you know, and I popped off a scripture to her. I kept going over these things with her. Everything she did, I was like, that's, that's God. It's a biblical principle that this hospital is doing on you. And, and when she, one of the times she said something, and I slammed my hand on that table. Sorry. The oppression left. It's gone. I can't. It just is gone. I, can, I can't be sad now. There's been things that have happened, and I mean... They're sad things, but I can't stay there. I will never, ever, because I am delivered from depression. That oppression is gone, and it's because of the blood of Jesus. I can tell you, I can tell you too, that that's just a consistency, a willingness to stand and stand there for, not give up. You know, it's kind of like the old statement, you know, if you just don't give up, you win. Right. And if you stick with God, you win, praise God. Yes. Amen. Cassie, you're next. I don't guess any of these people came to hear you, did they? Oh, I love it. I'm grateful they did. <laughs> praise the Lord. Love her testimony. Give her a good hand. Okay, so I've had many testimonies since I started attending CFF. Truly life-changing. Um, I have so many cool things that have happened. I have grown so much spiritually. He's blessed me in motherhood. God showed me, you know, how to release my faith in the things I need in motherhood. He's blessed my marriage beyond what I could ever imagine. And so I just, I have a lot of testimonies, but I chose two tonight. Um, they're both healing testimonies. But I want to say, so especially this first one came um, just because I was here and I was hearing the word of God and I made sure that I made it to church. And for a while, I hadn't been doing that. Um, I hadn't found CFF yet and it was just different. 
And I will also say that being under anointed um, teacher, like we were talking about at Pastor Appreciation, because I had been in church all my life. I'd grown up in church, and I still did not know many of the things I know now and grown as much as I have now. So this first one, um, one day I was at work, and I started noticing my heart fluttering really fast. And it was just strange, and I didn't know what was going on. And that day I had actually, after work, went, I had good health insurance where I worked, so I was like, I'm just going to go get it checked out. So I went to an urgent care um, clinic, and they just ran some tests on me and said, everything looks fine. Um, I said, you know, they checked my heart. And I was like, I had some caffeine today. I don't know if, you know, sometimes that can affect me. So they agreed, just limit your caffeine, see how it goes, and go from there. And so I really didn't have many problems until after I lost my health insurance. And then the symptoms seemed to, like, you know, come back pretty strong. And at that time, again, didn't have strong faith in finances, didn't want to spend my husband's all his money on tests and stuff. Like, I didn't know what was going on. My heart would be fluttering, and I kind of had some pain, and I would notice myself rubbing my chest. I knew it wasn't like a heart attack because it would come and go. So I was like, is this something I need to be concerned about? Is it not? Um, I remember crying to Alex one time at lunch, just like, I don't know what to do. And he's like, just go get it checked out. So I went to the doctor. They had ran some tests. Um, they kind of started thinking it was like more digestive. Like, so they tested me for a stomach bacteria that came back negative. And next step was they wanted to send me to a specialist to get an EGD. So I called them. That's the correct term, right? EGD. <laughs> and um, so I called them and without health insurance, it was going to be $1,000. So I was like, put that off. I was like, okay. So one night I was at church and the symptoms got so bad. I literally thought to myself, I'm going to have to leave because my heart was just fluttering so bad. I literally, it was like, I was panicking. My head was so loud. I was like, I'm just gonna have to walk out. And then finally, I just like had this peace over me. I thought maybe pastor will give an altar call for healing and I'll go. And sure enough, pastor gave an altar, ho- uh, altar call for healing. And I came up and right then and there, I received my healing. It's never been a problem. It was never a problem after that. Never called another doctor about it. It was completely immediate. It was an immediate healing after that prayer. And truly, it's because I came and I heard the word of God. I wasn't looking for a healing, I was, I, but I heard the word of God, and I heard it, and I heard it, and faith came, and I received my healing. Amen. So the next one, this is really, that one's easy to share for me. The next one is very deeply personal, and it's actually about a problem that many people didn't know I had. I never um, shared it with a lot of people. So growing up, I suffered from OCD, and if you don't know what that is, so a horrible mental disorder, um, you kind of are always stuck in your head. I'll just say that. Not many people knew I dealt with it. Um, forgive me if I read some of this one, because like I said, it's deeply personal, so I don't really want to go off on rabbit trails. Um, I never told anyone the extent of what I was going through, minus sometimes I would try to tell my mom and my sister, but for the longest time through childhood, they really didn't know the extent of what was going on in my head. Um, And in fact, for a long time, I thought I was the only one in the world who dealt with it. I didn't know what it was. Um, I remember seeing a special on the news when I was younger about somebody who had an OCD. And I'm like, I'm like a kid, but I hear the news. I'm like, wait, that lady's like me. She sounds like just like me. And so she was explaining her symptoms. And so I kind of started to realize, okay, this is like a condition. This is something that's going on. Um, so like I said, without going into a whole lot of details, um, if, you want, if you have any kind of issues like that, I'm happy to talk with you privately about it and, t- and discuss more of what was going on. But I will tell you that unless I was sleeping, there was not a day, uh, an hour that went by that I wasn't affected by it. So there wasn't a day that went by, there wasn't an hour. And unless I was sleeping, oftentimes there wasn't even a minute that went by that I was not somehow affected by this OCD in my head. Um, there were different symptoms. It was, it was hard to pray. There was just different things that would make me start over and start over and start over. Um, I'll say for a while, like the symptoms change. They kind of go through seasons. And like one season of your life, they're completely different than another. Um, For a long time, there was a season season I thought I was going to hell. I could never finish my prayers for forgiveness, so I thought I was going to hell. It was just another, it was just, um, I remember like in youth or... um, even children's church, you know, prayer requests. Mine would be that God always stays close to me and that God always holds on to me. And they, you know, they were kind of like, wow, impressed. Like, but really it was because I was clinging on to God. I was like, please don't send me to hell. Like, I I gotta get there. And um, so just throughout my entire childhood, I remember the first symptoms starting in third grade. And as a little girl, I always thought like by the time I was an adult, I wouldn't have to deal with it. Somehow I would be free from it. And so as I got older and like there was birthdays, coming and I was still dealing with this 
then I had my first child and I was still dealing with this and I would look back and think of myself as that little girl that was just, you know, kind of putting some faith in me as an adult. Like, you're going to get this figured out, right? Like, surely you're not going to deal with this your entire life. Um, So one day, just one day, my eyes were open and I received my healing. So um, I had been sitting under pastor's teaching for a couple of years now. So the first one, you know, altar call, got prayed for, healing immediately. That was only after several months of being here. This one was, I had a couple of years of pastors anointed teaching, showing me what to do, telling me what to do. And I kind of had heard God tell me, you know, you just need to sit down and deal with this because I had really put it off. It was something I learned to live with. I mean, I was high functioning. A lot of people had no idea that I was going through this. So I kind of just put it off and lived with it. And I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep living with it. And so I, when he told me he need to deal with this, I got my journal out and I just started writing. And I, I thought if I write down, you know, what I remember, where it started, where I'm at now. And that's what I did. I wrote, you know, what I remember, where it started, where, how my symptoms changed and where I was at now. And then I thought the game plan was going to be, I'm going to go find scriptures for that and speak to those fears. So that was going to be the game plan. Well, instead, shortly after, I was reading um, Kenneth Hagin's book, The Name of Jesus. And as I'm reading it, I come to this one page and it has a confession for you to say. And this confession just aligned right with what I needed. And it was about freedom and it was about not being held captive and the name of Jesus can set you free. And I will say, I have tried to like set myself free, you know, in the past when I was younger, I remember getting out my Bible as a teenager and it's like right here, it says, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free indeed. And, you know, I would kind of hold on to that for a day or two, or even just try to ignore the mental stuff going on, but that doesn't last. That's not, yeah. And so, um, so I, wrote down my own version of this confession that Hagen had. It was really similar to his, and then I inserted what I needed for my specific healing. And I was all excited for Allie to take a nap. She was really, she was a young baby then, and I was going to go in my closet, and I was going to command this confession with authority, and I knew it was going to work. I was so excited. I was so excited for her to take a nap and everyone to leave the house so I could go by myself with God and get this done, and that's what I did. And so just to, I mean, just to really solidify the healing, that night happened to be the first night that my firstborn slept away from me. She slept at my mother-in-law's house. And so usually, if you know anything about mental issues, that night would have been hard. It would have been all up in my head, you know, trying to keep her safe with my mental whatever. And instead... (laughs) I will just say, if this kind of helps you know what I was going through, I was so surprised that that was the first time since I could remember that I could watch a movie without repeating any of the lines. <laughs> so just the one small, but truly that night I kept thinking, oh, I'm not, I don't have these symptoms. They are not here. And, and kind of another thing that was really cool is I imagined it, like a vision of these um, after I did speak that. I could notice a difference already. And then I kind of like in my head imagine these little bats like picking at my bones, like trying to stay, like this symptom wants to stay and this symptom wants to stay. And I said, no, you were all leaving. All symptoms are gone. And I told God I wanted complete healing. And that's what I've gotten. This was in 2021, something that had affected me since at least third grade. And so it's been years now and it doesn't affect me anymore. And I'm completely healed, completely delivered. Um, So... And like I said, hearing and hearing the word of God. And I had started devoting more time to speaking with God and just being with God. So really there was, like I said, neither of these was like, I'm seeking my healing. How do I do this? How do I? It was all just because God, hearing God being. So thank y'all for listening. Cause I will say, I have not shared that with many people. So thank y'all for listening. And I love y'all. You know, you think about the significance of that. I mean, really what she did is she got her faith built through the word. But what do you got to do with that faith? What do you got to do with it? You got to turn it loose. And that's exactly what she did. She got to that place where she knew this is my moment. And she turned that faith loose. And even when the symptoms come back, guess what you do? You say, "Uh uh-uh, not going to happen in Jesus' name. Amen? But I'm going to tell you, that's the significance of getting the word in your life because faith does come by hearing by the but then you got to turn it loose got to have a place to turn it loose brandy you're the you're the closer no 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 man we're still good we can still go at least another hour huh no i'm not going an hour
We could go at least another hour. That's okay. You want me to call Josh? I'm a fast talker. No, don't do that. He needs to stay where he's at, and don't uh, let him look at me either. <laughs> this is going to make me look really bad because you caught on to that healing really fast, and it took me a lot longer. It's sort of embarrassing to even give this testimony, but it's still good because God's good. It's just I was the problem, just so you all know. I know you already knew that. Um, I have been, I'm not still a problem. I'm good now, right, Pastor? I like your tie this morning, by the way. <laughs> okay, so I have, yeah, sorry. I have been, um, I had dealt with headaches for a really long time. Like, since I was like 17-ish, right before I got married, just headaches and sinus, you know, just and I'm talking like a major headache. Like, I don't know how many of you have ever dealt with headaches. It's not like, it's not like, oh, I have a headache today. It was like, you cannot focus. You have a hard time um, not crying because it hurts so bad. It is, I guess, considered maybe a migraine at some point. I don't really know the difference, but it was bad, but it got worse and worse. And that's over 20 years, okay? So we're, we're talking like this year is my testimony, okay? So it's really sad. Um, I had dealt with this for so long, but just like she said, it, it's the weirdest thing. I just lived with them. I, I didn't like, like I just got so used to them that it wasn't even a, I didn't even think, oh, I need to be delivered from headaches. It was just like, oh, here comes my monthly headache, you know, let's deal with it. And it's just like, make it through it. That's what, that's my, that was my goal. So I, and my headaches caused me to like have you know, sick to my stomach, nauseous, you know, we would get in the truck, and when you're at church, the anointing is there, and it was the craziest thing. I knew I had to get to church every time. I never missed church for a headache, so I walked through those doors, and sometimes you sit there, and you think, I hope nobody talks to me today, and then other times, you're like, no, I can do this, and then I'd leave, and I'd be like, like, like blood sugar is so low, you can't even move, and, jo- and Josh's like, you okay, just get me home quickly, and my kids will even tell you I have a, you know, so my headaches would last one to three days. That was a good one. The horrible ones were five days. And to deal with that while you have to work or teach homeschool, that was a rough day, okay? So, um, you know, I expected those headaches one to two times a month. I expected them. Like, I received them. I never, you know, I, I talked about them, my headaches, you know? And I had a ritual. I'd take a shower. I would get this bowl of steamy water as hot as I could, like, like burn your face, but you didn't care because you just put those oils in and you breathe it in, and then you take in a leave and you go to bed, and your kids know, no, don't mess with her because she might be grumpy. <laughs> so anyways, um, they were bad, and I just got used to them. And so I, it, I just remember, I've, I've been to the altar calls I had come to them, but the problem was that I didn't realize, I, you know, I, I didn't know why they kept coming back, but what I seen was that during that altar call, I received the healing, which is so, I say it's so easy to obtain the faith, especially when you're at church, right? Because you're excited, and you're like, yes, I'm going to get up there, I'm going to get it right now, and I got it, but when I walked out the door, I didn't maintain it, and that was a key. I had to hold on to it, and I didn't. I just you know, thought, okay, I'm all good. And then, you know, whatever, here comes another headache later that month or whatever. So April of this year, (laughs) I remember Miss Kathy, she, I was so sick that I was the worst it had ever been. Yeah, you remember that, huh? I just remember sitting in my chair. I love to worship. I mean, I love, love, love. I don't care what you think of me when I'm up here. I am not singing to you, and I don't care if you hear my voice. I am literally so thankful to God because I have other testimonies. I know my authority. I, I have so many other testimonies, but this healing, it was hard for me. I just, was, I just didn't, I couldn't get it. And so I remember sitting there, and I just wanted to praise, but I just couldn't. Like, I felt like I was paralyzed in my body and in my mind, like there was no clarity. And it was just like, she couldn't move. And I remember she turned around and she was like, after church, she's like, are you okay? And I was like, oh my goodness, light bulb went off. And I just thought it gotten so bad that even my pastor's wife has noticed I'm not even doing church right right now. You know what I mean? And I love church, you know? So I knew something was wrong. That was my point of, okay, I got to do something about this. So I decided to go seek God. 
And that's what we're supposed to do, right? And it was right after we finished the spirit domination, the spirit, you know, the temple, which was so good, and then the faith. And then, of course, the battle of the mind just rolled this all together. And so I needed to ask God, what's going on here? How do I deal with these? I am literally sick and tired of these. I mean, I, you, I had to get angry, right? I had to get so mad at these headaches. That I'm done with them. I don't want them anymore. I'm not taking it. So what I did was I stopped looking at the circumstances because I remember you, you, gave a, you gave this like weird, not weird, just it was out of the ordinary moment. I remember because I took one page on it. It was, you know, and I was like, it was just random. It was before he started his sermon. And he said, if you want healing, he said, stop looking at the circumstances and look to the word. And I wrote that down. You said it in more words than that. But I wrote those two things down. And I said, I'm going after this. And then you had given a testimony. And I just remember the words, Jesus is Lord over my body. And it kept going, kept going. And then I told myself, oh, like, I haven't heard it already for 20 years. Like, for the first time, I'm like, oh, I'm actually, if I am letting Jesus be the Lord of my body, I'm actually technically not even allowed to take this headache. And I had never thought of that before. Like, I kept taking the headaches and signing for them, speaking it on my mouth. Yeah, I get headaches all the time. That's, that's normal. Oh, you should hear how good mine are, you know. I, I'm not even allowed to take that. It's not even a part of me, right? And just like she said, those were only symptoms. And that light bulb went off when you, when you said something about symptoms. And I thought, yeah, if we're really spirits, and that is the spirit realm that we're supposed to stay in, then all these symptoms, they're not even real. They're not real. Yes, I can feel them in my flesh. It's not like I was like, oh, I can't feel my headaches anymore. No, they're real in the world, but I'm supposed to be walking by faith. So in that realm, they're not real. They're trickery from the devil, right? And so like light bulb went off in my head. And so in May, I remember, you know, in any time before I would think, oh, I haven't had a headache this month. And literally the next day, headache. But this time in May, I was like, oh, this is going good. But I'm not going to tell pastor just yet, you know, <laughs> That was, well, duh, you know, whatever. So I didn't. So that was failure too, you know, whatever. Anyways, in, sep- in, in August, I went up there and I told him. I was so excited because I had kind of skipped the summer and forgot about it. Isn't that weird? 20 years and all of a sudden you just forgot. I'm not having a headache this month, whatever. But I thought, that's so cool. And I started counting the months on my hand. And I thought, no headache for that many months? So I went and told him. And of course, since then, I have had attacks where the symptoms tried to come. And then I took the word and I said, I am healed. I don't receive you. I don't even get headaches. And you're not real. And I'm not receiving it, right? I am healed. Um, and then I remind myself, I'm not even allowed to have a headache. So sorry. You know what I mean? So um, it's, it's just, that is a big, big deal in my life. That was a big, big deal for me. So I just continued to, you know, those, those symptoms can come and knock in, but you just ignore it. Okay, my next one is really fast, okay? But it's so good, I have to share it. So two and a half weeks ago, my truck got broke into. I don't know how many of you knew that. It was on a Wednesday morning. Well, they did it at like midnight. So they, they knew what they were doing, okay? These people were like, like the devil, like he knows what he's doing. He's not just randomly walking into your life going, I think I'll do something about that. No, he's strategic, and that's what this person was. They knew what to do to a Denali to get in there. They, they did know how to n- make the horn not go off. And they ransacked my truck. But I don't really keep anything in my car. It stays pretty clean. However, this one time I had my entire work bag for Terry Mize Ministries with my computer, with my phone, the, the ministry phone, my beautiful leather bag, which I won't tell you how much it was, and... The most important thing to me, because, you know, all those things were so, they're replaceable. The most important things was my paperwork, because I live and breathe ministry, Terry Mize, and orphans. And without my paperwork, I can't follow through with my next thing. So I was, I was like, oh my, whoa, I've never had that happen. So Miss Renee comes out, and of course I have to tell her, she's my boss. I got to tell my boss. All your stuff just got stolen because of me. (laughs) They're so sweet. They're so good. But she said, you know what? We're just going to take authority right now. And I was like, so, you know, Nicole and Tamara were there at the same time. So we all get in this circle with my boys. And 
she starts taking authority, and I'm like, yes, because I know my authority. And I say, yes, we're, the, the, my biggest concern was that the enemy would use something in that bag to destroy or take away money from the ministry. I mean, that's how he works, right? So I knew we need to do that first. So we took authority over that, and then she mentioned, and, and that bag is going to get back in her hands, and, and then my brain goes, oh, I didn't actually, well, I wasn't really believing for that, but that's a good idea. <laughs> I remember my brain like, yeah, I don't know about that, but yeah, okay, that's a good idea. I'm just like, okay, processing now. Yes, okay, we're going to do it. And so, not that I don't believe God can do it, I just didn't think of it, you know, so I'm like, okay, let's just get a new computer. No. So, in the meantime... I go to church that night. It's a Wednesday night, and like, I love the song. It's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day. You know, I'm not going to sing it for you, but it's, anyway, no, it's not. But he does such a good job. My kids are like, oh, not the song again. I'm like, turn it up. Yeah, uh uh-huh. And so (laughs) when I heard that song on the way down there, um, the guy on the radio said, yeah, when he wrote this song, the next day, something bad happened in his life, and he had to remember what he was Singing to all these people, it's going to be a great day, even in the midst of what has happened to you. Because you see, all of us have attacks every day. It's not, it, it has to be a great day for everybody. We got to put our, our faith where our mouth is, right? Or money where, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote that, yeah. Um, so we, so I was like, so I hear the song come, and I was like, okay, it's going to be a great day. Yes, yes, it is. So I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to praise just like I would every Wednesday. So I get up here, and every time we were singing hallelujah, you know, a thousand hallelujahs, and one more hallelujah, I could just see us punching the devil in the face, right? Like, you're annoying me, and this ain't happening, buddy, right? So then time goes on, and there's bait, right? The enemy tries to bait you. So here's the bait. Well, if you need us to go ahead and get your computer now, a new one, well, I don't, you know, I'm thinking, I, I, I'm confused now, because I'm like, well, I got to work. I mean, I need to actually do the work that I was supposed to have done three days ago, <laughs> right? So I need to do my work. But then at the same time, I'm, I really am expecting that bag back. So I'm sort of like in this part, like, what do I do? So I just kind of listen to the Lord. Okay, I'll get anything old. So I'll just look for an old computer, get my stuff done, and get an old phone, get my stuff done. So I got an old phone from somebody, and I just used my personal computer to get all my work done. And, okay, that's good, that's good. So then on my computer, there's these Excel sheets that I perfected for this particular year. And I thought, I need to start working on that now because our, our orphan project starts, like, you know, next week. So I need to start that now. And the Lord said, well, you can take the bait. And I was like, you're right. Because if it comes back, I don't need to restart them. So I didn't. I didn't restart it at all. And then I got all these fraud alerts from the bank had nothing to do with that, but we didn't know that at the time. You don't know, right? So you have, I had to like walk so carefully to listen to the Holy Spirit. Is this, is this a bait from the devil? Or do I really need to do something about this here, right? So step by step, anyways, to make a long story short, I basically, uh, Wednesday, had gotten the old phone, had to get a new SIM card, blah, 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 nightmare with AT&T. But either way, they got the job done. I had just put the SIM card in that phone that that day, that afternoon, my bosses came and had to um, show me a few things that I need to start working on. And they were leaving, and I got a call on that phone that I had just put the SIM card in. But here's the thing. The guy called and said, yes, we need to talk to a Mr. Terry Mize. And I was like, well, this is his office. And he said, well, there's a brown bag here. And I was like, there's a brown bag there. But, uh, but it said Terry Mize. I'm not Terry Mize. I don't want his brown bag. I want my bag. So I started to talk to this guy, and I'm like, wait a minute. I said, what's that bag look like? And then I just said, is it huge, and it's really pretty? And he was like, I guess. I was like, I was like well, how do you know it's Terry Mize's? And he goes, well, I had to open it up and look in the papers, and uh, you know, it has Terry Mize on the emails or whatever. I was like, oh, that's my bag. So I get off the phone with the guy. I forgot to ask him any questions. I was like... Oh, thank you. I was so excited. I was telling the mice, I found my bag. So I hang up. Well, in the meantime, before this, every time I'd say something to somebody, like if they say, have you, have you heard from your bag yet? You know, have you gotten? 
Yes, I, no, I haven't heard from it back, you know, back from it yet, but I believe in for every piece of paper to be in order. That's what I kept saying. And it didn't feel normal to say that in my brain because I thought, who's going to leave my papers in order? They're going to dig through everything to find anything they can keep, you know? But my brain was saying that, okay? Not my heart. My heart was saying every paper in order. And so I called the guy back, and it was at a different hotel. So they stole it, took it to a different hotel, whatever they did with it. The lawn guy found it. The lawn guy found my bag and turned it into the hotel. Well, the hotel thought that it was somebody who stayed there. So they're wa- they didn't call anybody. So they're waiting till the very, you know, next week or whatever. But hey, I pulled up, got my bag. The only thing missing was a charger cord, which you know, whatever. Every piece of paper, every check, there were checks in there. Everything in order, everything in it but a charger. I mean, that's huge to my life, to my life. And God is so big that we can't limit him with our brain, right? We've got to just know he's so good. He's so good. So that's all I had. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, God God. is no respecter of persons. Acts chapter 10. Peter said, I perceive this. God is no respecter of persons. And that means that, guess what? He doesn't respect the individual. He respects their faith. He respects the very faith of God that helps them to receive what he has for them. Amen? Amen. And God can give you more testimonies as well. How many of you know that's true? Stand your feet. Okay. One thing I heard through all of these testimonies was the word. And I love this scripture. It's Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. It doesn't matter how long it took, Brandy. The word was working. It may have been different for Cassie than it was with you or, or for Kim. But it's that word. It's staying under the teaching of the word and keeping the word before your eyes because it's like a fire and it's like a hammer and it's working on that stuff. And you've got to realize that don't give up. Don't think, well, it's been too long. It's, it's never too long. Think of the man at the pool of Bethesda. 30-something 30, 30 years he had been in that condition, but it wasn't too late and it wasn't too long for Jesus. Amen. 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 blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.